Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the 23rd of March, 2015, the podcast that jumps forward into history. This is your host, Shane Killian, and joining me again this week is Charles Thomas. Charles, welcome back to the show. Hello, everybody. Let's Wayne Scott the news of the bogus. And we've been talking about the futility of governments forcing ISPs to block websites like the Pirate Bay. And we've been going at this from the angle that it just means that people are going to go to other sites and then all the proxies or other BitTorrent sites or whatever are going to come up and take its place. But now, it seems like with this revitalized version of the Pirate Bay, their new network setup makes it resistant to blocks, so most of them aren't working at all. Wow. I mean, it's not like we all said this was going to happen, but, you know, who cares about listening to rationality and common sense? But, you know, <laughs> it doesn't change anything. Uh, with the Pirate Bay which is um, a site that does shares and all that information and such. I think sites like that are, are really good to hold information, which is a good thing. I mean, sometimes play, people, you know, basically put that stuff up there. I mean, I know you, once upon a time, had stuff on the Pirate Bay, right, Shane? I still do. Uh, some of the old uh, video compilations and things like that, uh, How Evolution is Scientific and a couple other things. Still there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you still use it. And it's not... I think the reason why is like, oh my goodness, copyright stuff. Well, you can easily have copyright stuff on an SD card. You don't think people should go like, okay, we should ban SD cards. <laughs> oh man, back when I started in on computers, you know, we had the Commodore VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. There was no internet, no file sharing, anything like that. We had these user groups and we'd all bring our disks to the user group and we'd just copy each other's floppy disks. Yeah. You know, that's what my dad did as well. And I grew up like in the same time, 80s and then 90s and such, seeing not only, you know, stuff in the early PC and everything. You know, we copy things from CDs and property discs. This stuff right here just shows what governments, they are so behind the times. Well, and the internet was made so that information can travel easily around the world. It actually resists attempts to stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. doesn't stop them from trying, man. You know, yeah, they're going to get that square peg in that round hole somehow, even though it's destroyed the entire board, but still, <laughs> they're going to keep trying. So what's happened is the Pirate Bay is now using Cloudflare to deal with the traffic, and Cloudflare is a great thing for sites to use. It saves them a lot of traffic. And what you do is you actually get the website, not from the site's web server, but from Cloudflare, and Cloudflare is checking the original site to see if there are like any changes or anything. If there are no changes, it just serves you, you know, the page as it is from its cache and doesn't even get there. And it can also do things like full strict SSL encryption, uh, sometimes called HTTPS strict or uh, HSTS, I think it is, hypertext strict transport security. And that's what's going on here because they can block the pirate bay. But people aren't getting it from the Pirate Bay. They're getting it from Cloudflare. Or they use uh, other means like Tor or all these other type of uh, ways to get past all these uh, little restrictions. But I mean, even the point is, even if people aren't actively getting past it by going through the Tor network or going to a proxy or something, people who are just normally going to the Pirate Bay are just automatically getting around these bands because of Cloudflare. Yeah. I think a couple of uh, podcasts ago, they said that something over in the UK said, you know, why are we going to keep doing this type of stuff? Why do we keep doing this? It's going to just, it's just fruitless and such. And this right here proves it. It is a fruitless endeavor. I honestly think if they uh, continue this, it's going to waste more money, more time off more useful things. Now, it isn't completely foolproof. You can access the Pirate Bay if you're in the UK, if you're on Virgin, EE, BT, and Talk Talk. But for some reason, it's still blocked on Sky. They were still able to get it blocked. You don't get the block message. It just doesn't load. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is, from the start, when they came back up, the Pirate Bay people said, yeah, we're using Cloudflare, but that's only temporarily until we get some other stuff going. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if they're working on their own solution for this to try and... When you come to this website, you're just kind of automatically rounded around blocks. And whatever they develop is going to be a boon for people in countries like China, where you have all the government censorship going on. You know, if you have a solution like this, where Chinese people can access all of these websites that would otherwise be blocked to them, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if stuff like 
YouTube or all these other bigger places might be using these type of things. Well, YouTube's already doing it. They have a distributed server system that goes around the world. Oh, yeah. So, again... Yeah, the reason for all the geoblocks on YouTube and Netflix and things like that is because YouTube and Netflix are complying with those orders to say, okay, we just won't let you watch this video. If you've got someone obstinate like the Pirate Bay who has something like this and it's like, no, everyone can do it, I don't know many ways you're going to stop them. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, hopefully they'll rise up and say, you know what, just they will just leave the internet on. But then again, you know, net neutrality and all. So, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Say, if you're tired of the promos in this podcast, well, the patrons got it early and with no ads or promos. Just go to patreon.bogosity.tv and donate at any level. History is written by the winners, and so apparently is economics. That's why there's LibertyClassroom.com. Probably the best single learning resource for history and economics on the web, LibertyClassroom.com teaches U.S. history, Western Civ, and economics from actual university professors. There's lots of free material to get you started, including introductory lectures on all these subjects. And when you sign up, you get the full site's content for just $99 a year, less than the price of two cups of coffee a month. And if you type in the promo code BOGOSITY in all caps, you'll get your first year for just $88. Lectures are available in both video and audio format, so you can watch or listen to them on your computer, your phone or tablet, or in your car. Learn at your own pace about the subjects you're interested in and become a more effective debater. You'll also get access to lots of supplemental materials and even the professors themselves via the discussion forum and even live video chats. Inform yourself against the myths and propaganda of our society. Visit libertyclassroom.com. So, you remember Sopa and Pipa? Oh, those little things. Yeah, how the whole internet just rallied up against them. Wikipedia went darker and everything. Well, now there's another one we have to worry about. CISA, C-I-S-A, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act. Uh, Yeah, another one. And it's all under the Democratic president who said transparency would be he will make this whole uh, administration transparent. And, well, look how that turned out. Yeah, (laughs) we'll get to that next. (laughs) But yeah, this is an article on errata security from security expert Robert Graham. So basically, the idea is that all of these different companies, uh, IBM and all these and all these Internet service providers and all the big companies like Amazon, they get a lot of information about cyber attacks. If they could only share that information then we could get a lot better information about cyber attacks and what we can do to prevent them in the future and stop them from happening to begin with. Sounds like a great idea, right? Well, here's what Robert Graham has to say about it. Quote, They did not consult us security experts when drafting this bill. If they had, we would have told them the idea doesn't really work. Companies like IBM and Dell SecureWorks already have massive cybersecurity information sharing systems where they hoover up large quantities of threat information from their customers. This rarely allows them to prevent attacks as the CISA bill promises. In other words, we've tried the CISA experiment and we know it doesn't really work. So they're doing something that has been proven to fail. To paraphrase a certain internet reviewer, uh, Mr. Andrew says, they know it's wrong, but they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. But what Graham points out is, what it will really do is, quote, cause mass surveillance. Most of the information produced by countermeasures is, in fact, false positives, triggering on innocent anomalies rather than malicious hackers. Your normal day-to-day activities on the Internet occasionally trigger these false positives. When this information gets forwarded to law enforcement, it puts everyone in legal jeopardy. It may trigger an investigation, or it may just become evidence about you, for example, showing which porn sites you surf. It's mass surveillance through random sampling. So, yes, a huge, huge violation of civil liberties and such. But, hey, you know, we have to do it, Shane, because our freedoms are in jeopardy, because we have to take away our freedoms. Yeah. Yeah, and he actually points to clauses in the bill that demonstrate that this is actually what they want, such as, quote, How the information can be used in cases of sexual exploitation of minors. Don't they always like using that as an excuse? If CISA were about prevention, then it would be useless in such cases. But CISA 
isn't about prevention. It's about gathering information after the fact while prosecuting a crime. They will destroy a person's life and everything else, but they will not really stop any type of crime. It's just basically filling the pads up. They're basically just doing, okay, we're just going to fill these things up so we it looks like we're doing some good. As long as they've got someone to parade in front of news cameras and say, hey, look at what we did. We took this dangerous person off the street even though he wasn't really doing anything wrong. Yeah, exactly. So, to, so the roots would be happy while real crimes, real evil is still going on. Yeah. And Graham also points out, quote, even if SISA could work, it would still be dampened by the fact that government is both incompetent and corrupt. The FBI and DHS do not have adequate technical expertise. We can see that from the incomplete and incorrect warnings they produce. That they are corrupt is demonstrated by whether something is a cyber threat indicator changes according to what is politically correct. Who receives the best information depends on who is best politically connected. SISA even calls for loyalty oaths to the United States before the government will even consider sharing threat information. Conversely, the FBI today regularly threatens people to suppress them from sharing cyber threat information that would embarrass the politically connected. Of course, regardless of how many times, you know, you know, politicians do so many dirty and you know, immoral things. And that's just the local politicians, by the way. I mean, you, you can probably fill up a whole bogosity thing just on local stuff alone while you in your neck of the woods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> including my my stuff here and my, you know, little uh, patch of land, but also the national stage. And now this bill gets on. It basically will probably say, you know, the uh, congressman was doing this, um, you know, was using his funds to do this, this, that. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that, that never happened. Just put that away in the file cabinet. No. Yeah, and Graham talks about his personal experience with this, quote, When I was favored by the FBI, I received special threat information others did not. When I was not in favor with the FBI, I received threats trying to stop me from embarrassing the politically connected. Yeah. I mean, this reminds me of a story, local story, about these, like, the diplomats just running through lights in D.C., you know, just doing these horrible things, yet, you know, no one, they didn't go to jail, didn't do anything. Of course not. It's like, it, and these people who really believe, and they're good and they're smart and what have you, put these people in office, these corrupt people, and think, oh, they're gonna, they're going to watch themselves. Well, it's just like the case we talked about on the podcast. I think it was a couple of years ago. There was this uh, state trooper in Florida who started pulling over a fellow trooper. I think it was, or maybe it was like a sheriff or something because he was just speeding without his lights and you know weaving around dangerously so she started pulling him over and giving him tickets and man she ended up having to leave the state i think she got so much harassment she got death threats from police officers you know state and local all over the place it was just horrible yes. all because she tried to do the right thing you know the right thing for these people is just letting them do whatever they want and, and arrest people uh, like us or what have you for doing minor offenses and saying, see, we are, we're not corrupt. We got the real bad guys, even though they're doing things that are more egregious. It's just basically lords and ladies all over again. Yeah. So Graham closes out, quote, SISA does not work. Private industry already has exactly the information sharing the bill proposes, and it doesn't prevent cyber attacks as SISA claims. On the other side, because of the false positive problem, SISA does far more to invade privacy than even privacy advocates realized, doing a form of mass surveillance. Even if it could work and privacy could be protected, SISA creates a corrupt system for the politically connected. This is a typical bad police state bill and not one that anybody should take seriously as something that would stop hackers. It won't stop them from basically saying if you don't support this bill... The terrorists will win. Yep. Which that's going to be what their uh, mantra is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And protect the children. Yeah, of course. Hackers, terrorists, the NSA. But I repeat myself. Your online security is under attack, and the weakest point is your password. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass plugs into your browser and allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords anywhere on the web, all protected by one master password. 
LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers and all your computers, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, membership info, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications and even mobile devices, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. So we've talked about the Obama administration, the most transparent administration in history, and how they've avoided FOIA requests, the Freedom of Information Act requests, doing things like blacking out every single word on every single page, things like that. Now they're just coming right out and saying, hey, you know that FOIA stuff? Yeah, that just doesn't apply to us. Yeah, of course it doesn't. It never does. I and mean, people, and, and you know, as someone who voted for President Obama in 2008, I actually believed that, that he might actually, I'm not saying he would have really done all the things he wanted to do. I'm like, that, that'd be stupid. But at least at least somewhat, at least one fourth of what he would do, at least the, the, the whole transparency thing, which would be, I would have been really great. I mean, true transparency would be nice. But sadly, it didn't happen. It just, they don't really care. They don't care. And it's heartbreaking because, you know, it just continues to get worse. Every administration keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm just really, really just shuddering the fact that it's going to get even worse, whether it's uh, Jeb Bush or Hillary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is nothing different than what President Bush did. It's just that now what Bush and Obama have been doing is now an official policy. Yeah. And according to Ann Wiseman, of the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, or CREW, quote, It is completely out of step with the president's supposed commitment to transparency. That is a critical office, especially if you want to know, for example, how the White House is dealing with email. Yeah, and again, they are the lords and ladies, kings and queens, and we are the rooms who are not worthy for knowing what they are. They know better, so, yeah. you know. And Tom Fitton of Judicial Watch said, quote, this is an office that operated under the FOIA for 30 years, and when it became politically inconvenient, they decided they weren't subject to the Freedom of Information Act anymore. Of course. I mean, again, uh, it's just we have stories like this. We continue to see this again. And people, and you know what they will call you? They will shout you out, and they will say, you're a racist because you're not talking about I'm like, there's no race involved in this. This happened late. Like I said, the whole thing was about the Bush administration and everything else, and and, and President Obama, the you know Senator Obama, when he's comparing, said he wanted to make this the most transparent. He said it himself, and now he's there. There's no transparency at all. Once you have, when you have the power to be transparent, you should do this thing. You can be that example. It's going to be hard. Of course, it's going to be hard. You put yourself in that position. But when you continue to just say no, we don't want this, this, and now just saying nope, we're not going to do this at all. It just says that you know what. What you said not only is a liar, uh, but honestly, you're doing damage to the office. You're doing damage to uh, the presidency and the, the generations afterwards. They're going to look at this and say, well, this is how it's supposed to be. Less information for the people. Next thing you know, you have a ministry of propaganda or something, which I don't think it's going to happen overnight. But, you know, when you don't have transparency, stuff like that does happen. Yeah. So Carter, Reagan... The first Bush and Clinton all did a pretty good job of complying with FOIA requests. And so did the Bush administration until Cruz sued over a bunch of emails that were deleted by the White House, by some counts as many as 22 million of them. And so they wanted information about this and it, they started off complying with the information and then they said, mm, nah, we're not going to do it. And according to Tom Blanton, director of the National Security Archive at George Washington University, quote, the government made an argument in an effort to throw everything in the kitchen sink into the lawsuit in order to stop the archiving of White House emails. And then in 2009, a federal appeals court ruled that the White House's Office of Administration wasn't subject to the FOIA, quote, because it performs only operational and administrative tasks in support of the president and his staff, and therefore, under our president, 
lacks substantial independent authority. And so now, White House emails have to be released under the Presidential Records Act, which means that they don't release them until five years after the end of the administration. Yeah, so, again, no real transparency. We don't know what's really you know, happening with our leaders and such. And don't be surprised the next administration will say, we're going to extend that. Next thing you know, it could be 100 years where you can look at the emails and stuff like that. It would be like way beyond people like, well, who cares? Who cares? Like the same reaction to the um, coup happened in Iran back in the 50s. The CIA had something, uh, had that whole yeah. thing. To do 1953, with. yeah, when they deposed Prime Minister Mosaddegh, yeah. Yeah. And you know what the response was? Like, well, who cares? You know, this, that, the other, da, 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 and everything else. Well, that was 30 years ago. Who cares if it directly led to the hostage crisis and all that? I feel like people are just like, they want to get allowances and excuses to these people in power because they have these certain teams, you know, Democrat or Republican. Why are you living in the past? We have to move forward. Exactly. <laughs> Even though we could look at the past and, you know, learn from it or just repeat it. In infant, just we keep repeating history, which sadly so many people seem to be loving to do these days. So Press Secretary Josh Ernest has responded for this and said that this regulation was just, quote, an administrative change and has no impact on our compliance with the Freedom of Information Act. And he's probably right there. They weren't complying with it before, so they're not going to be complying with it now. So in the end, it's meaningless. And then people are like, you know, we have to keep those things secret. To protect us. It's protecting them, is what it is. Yeah. And he said that people were welcome to submit requests, but he didn't have any idea how those requests are actually going to be handled. So he doesn't even know. It's going to be done via smoke signal. <laughs> <laughs> so get practicing, Shane. <laughs> Can you read Morse code? That's how we're going to do it. You say you don't like Bitcoin? Why not? Oh, because it's not gold. No problem. Just go to coins.bogosity.tv and you'll be taken to Coinable, where you can buy gold or silver coins or bars with your bitcoins, with literally up-to-the-minute spot pricing. Now there's no reason not to jump on the Bitcoin bandwagon. Whether you're a Bitcoin miner, service operator, Bitcoin business owner, or market speculator, you can get gold and silver from reputable dealers. And Coinable has Bitcoin liquidity for fast processing of your order. Coinable even utilizes a special shipping infrastructure to ensure that your investment arrives safely at your door. And you know what? By going to coins.bogosity.tv, you won't pay a penny more, excuse me, a Satoshi more for your purchase. But you'll help this podcast. You can even sell your gold and silver for Bitcoin as well. Coinable is your Bitcoin to gold marketplace. So go to coins.bogosity.tv and start turning your Bitcoins into gold now. And now it's time to railroad this week's biggest bogan emitter. And this week it goes to Matt Boyle of Breitbart News, who wrote a hit piece on Liz Mayer, consultant to Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, because she dared to criticize the Holy Iowa Caucus. Stone the heretic! Ah, uh, she's always... Yeah, apparently she came out in favor of amnesty for illegal aliens and wide-open borders immigration policies. Yes, the idea that free and peaceful people have the right to cross imaginary lines written by politicians. How horrible. Yeah, but, you know, they'll say, well, we got to stop the evil criminals and see the, 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 the boogeyman and everything <laughs> else. Because, boo, 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 they, 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 they're coming in, they, they're taking our women and, and everything else, which is the same rhetoric you can hear over and over and over again. But, hey, you know, peaceful people, you get screwed. You got to sit like 20 years just to get in there. And then after that, you know, but then if you do one thing, well, you forgot to check that one box and you uh, forgot you skipped over. You know, we told you to skip over it. So another 30 years for you. See ya. Yeah. She also came out, you know, horribly and viciously in favor of same-sex marriage and abortion rights. Oh, the humanity. Yeah. So Boyle is whipping up all this frenzy about it, and then he's even going to the, well, it's not so much about that. It's about who's paying her while she's doing this advocacy. And what, what he writes in his story is, quote, and then he's quoting Mayor, we're contractually barred from disclosing our clients, Mayor said. That could mean anyone, even foreign companies potentially, were paying her during the time frame she was publicly advocating the amnesty bill. 
I mean, come on. As conspirator theories go, that one's kind of lame. Yes. Yes. The perfect plan. <laughs> We're going to go and buy off this politician, a politician that might not even come close to any type of power, to go and promote our type of um, way of doing things at the amnesty program. Truly, we are the greatest masterminds of the universe. And much of this is just around a couple of tweets that she did. One said, quote, In other news, I see Iowa is once again embarrassing itself and the GOP this morning. Thanks, guys. And this had to do with Scott Walker's speech in Des Moines, which is putting him in front and becoming like a GOP front runner, you know, alongside Jeb Bush and all of those. And she also made another tweet a minute later that said, quote, The sooner we remove Iowa's front-running status, the better off American politics and policy will be. Oh, that'd be nice, but, you know, we can't, it's tradition, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's the Iowa caucus. We have to do all of this because it's so important, except when it doesn't turn out the way we like, uh, like when Ron Paul wins it, and then all of a sudden it doesn't matter. <sighs> just why can't they just move do something that you know? I'm not saying the people of Iowa don't matter because they do, but it just seems like there should be a better way to deal with this because it seems like we just continue to go with these Iowa caucuses and everything else. Let's do something different. It's 2015, not 1815. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Well, there were some more sensible comments by Jazz Shaw at Hot Air, and he talked about her saying, "Quote." Dangerous opinions obviously included the pointless circus that is the Iowa caucuses, and it seems that this was the weapon of choice which was selected to bring about this sad state of affairs. But so what? So she said aloud what I guarantee you most of the presidential candidates are already thinking. Iowa is a pain in the backside which most of them wish they could avoid. They just don't say it. Well... Again, it's just the whole, you know, Iowa is the greatest thing in the universe, which sadly, like I said, you know, no one of this world could do like, oh, you hate Iowa. You hate I mean, No, we don't hate Iowa and everything else, people. We're just saying maybe we need to try to do something different. I mean, do something different to make sure that not only people in Iowa's voice matters, but also people around the country. I think when Ron Paul was running all these caucuses and all these other things, winning them, and then they don't matter. But yet, um, who was it? Not Ben Cotton. No, um, uh, the other black guy who was running it. Um, oh, uh, another one you're talking about. I'm drawing a blank on his name. Nine, 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 ninety nine. That guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't. It's going to drive me insane because um, he, he won one. One, and then they said he's the front runner. I'm like, wait a minute. You just won, uh, let's see, uh, won this one little caucus thing. You're not a front runner. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Can we just really stop? At, oh, it's a Herman Cain, by the way. Herman, Herman Cain. Cain. Yeah, that was it. it. That was the guy. Herman Cain, you know, win that one thing and everyone went crazy. You know, it's just, once again, we need to actually get something better for people to actually have a better voice. And not mandatory voting, which is completely stupid. <laughs> yeah, we're not getting into that. Maybe we'll talk about it next week, but whatever. So Shaw quotes his colleague Eric Erickson, quote, Team Walker has botched this. There's just no way Liz Mayer resigned with it being her idea. I haven't talked to her yet, but there's just no way. So instead of Walker owning this, he's passed the ball and made a staffer off herself. That's unfortunate and plays into the not ready for primetime theme already developing around Team Walker. But the voices who decided to stir this pot need to DIAF as far as I'm concerned. And that's an internet acronym which means die in a fire. Yeah. The people are so daggone sensitive these days, man. They just don't want to. We can't say these things. My heart's what? Hurt the, seriously? You have to hurt someone's feelings. Oh, no. Uh, you said something offensive. Oh, uh, people just think. Those some thicker skin. I mean, I mean, people just, they get, they get so, so sensitive. They need to stop being so sensitive and realize that, that maybe, just maybe, that most of those people are, they might be right. Like, you know what? If it's that bad, maybe we should all come together, Republicans, Democrats, or whatever, and say, maybe we should get a system that, doesn't focus on, say, Iowa caucuses or everything else. The fact that they're right makes it more offensive yeah. to them. Yeah. If they were wrong, they could handle it. But them being right just... <laughs> exactly. It just it hurts them, shakes in the core. Which, again, you can't, we have to find something better. But 
you know, it's it's this this is it's the easy way, which again, sadly, it's always been this way. That's why we do this, which is a dumb way to continue something. So as Shaw says, quote, This entire sordid mess says absolutely nothing about Liz Mayer. It speaks to the dangers of working in a professional field populated by people who are not in reality easily outraged, but rather people who are perpetually seeking something to look outraged about. And in that never-ending quest, no amount of friendly fire damage is too high a price to pay in exchange for a few days' worth of headlines, which will quickly be forgotten. Welcome to Politics in America. We've really managed to turn it into a garbage dump some days, haven't we? Well, I think it turned into basically a indie wrestling show in some cases. But then again, I think even an indie wrestling show is more entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, maybe Scott Walker deserves a brick bat, but it's Matt Boyle who stirred all this up to begin with who deserves the title of this week's Biggest Bogani Matter. Bogosity.tv is a participant in the Amazon Services LLC Associates program, an affiliate advertising program designed to provide a means for sites to earn advertising fees by advertising and linking to Amazon.com. Just clear your cookies and go to Amazon.Bogosity.tv or check the right-hand side of the podcast page for Amazon's best deals, including the deal of the day and limited-time lightning deals on all sorts of great products. So next time you buy online... Go to Amazon.Bogosity.tv. Bogosity.tv and all of its services are hosted at GoDaddy. I've been very satisfied with GoDaddy's services and their wonderful 24-7 customer support for over 10 years now. So I'm happy to be able to give you this special offer. Just sign up for any new domain, web hosting, email, or other service and get 35% off with the code WOWNOBOGON. That's W-O-W-N-O-B-O-G-O-N. Because there's nothing bogus about these savings on quality internet hosting. Just go to GoDaddy.com and use the code WOWNOBOGON. And now let's power wash this week's Idiot Extraordinaire! And this week it goes to Jim Humble, a former Scientologist who started his own church called Genesis 2. That on its own would probably be enough to secure him the title, but what really gives it to him this week is the new cure for autism that he's hawking, and it's, get this, a chlorine enema. And yes, it's every bit as bad as it sounds. Uh, Why? Why is this happening? And first off, why is he stealing from Genesis 2? Seriously? What, is this like uh, (laughs) the the, the last part of Genesis that... um, uh, that God remixed up was Earth 2? What is this whole <laughs> thing about this Genesis stuff? Which, I don't know. Maybe it's like Vatican 2 or something. Uh, electric Boogaloo. But, um, <laughs> there you go. Well, the product is called Miracle Mineral Solutions. It's a solution of 28% sodium chloride. And what they do is they tell you to mix it with citric acid. And that way it forms chlorine dioxide, ClO2, which is bleach. The same bleach that you bleach your clothes out with, or where they bleach industrial pulp and things like that. Yeah. And they're giving this dangerous substance to their children, both orally and in enemas. And, I mean, if you drink it orally, it's dangerous enough. But the thing is, if you do it in an enema, if you have it in rectally, it gets into your colon. It gets absorbed directly into your bloodstream. Oh. I mean, it is just incredibly stupid and dangerous. And they believe that it'll cure autism. Of course, you know what? This right here is not only stupid and moronic, but actually harms your child. And and just, oh my goodness, there are no words. Well, and the thing that's really getting me about it is knowing the people that I know who are on the spectrum, including my own son, and to be honest, kind of maybe being borderline spectrum myself, I'm really getting an attitude about people who treat autism like it's a disease to be cured. It's not. It's just the way the brain works. And yes, it can result in things like communications disorders that need to be dealt with. But I mean, it's not 
it's not a disease. You can, it's not like a cancer you can cut out or anything. It's the way their brains are put together. Yeah, I mean, I, I just like you know, again, I am a uh, slightly autistic. I am, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I have ADHD. I suffer from depression. You know, and, and when I see this stuff right here, that they say we can fix all this stuff, the parents who fall for this type of stuff. They say that they just say, oh, there's something wrong with your child. And more often not, it's not something wrong with your kids. Just like you have to have a little more patience and such. And I just, you know, and I am, I thank the Lord every day. And I know it's going to probably offend somebody else who are atheists. You know, screw it. I don't care. But um, <laughs> thank the Lord every day that my parents took time and helped me with my communication skills. You know, some people will say they didn't do too much of a good job. But still, you know, they, my communication skills, where I learned, all these type of things. I don't see myself as like being damaged or anything else. This has the added effect of not only harming the child, but also saying the child is already damaged and something's wrong with them, mm-hmm. which is not only a uh, lie, but also it's a dangerous one that just says, you know, this thing is not even close to even working. They say, well, there's still something wrong. I'm not to do some more stuff or anything else, which is not even the case. When, when they say stuff like this, take the word autism and replace it with black or Jewish or something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really what it is. It is. Again, it just comes right out of the old 18 and 1900s. You know, the, the old type of guy that Colonel Barker says, I will, will cure all your ills, ladies and gentlemen. I'll cure your ills right there. All your stuff will drink one little thing and your whole body will be completely perfect. You'll be Because this isn't just autism. This is malaria, Ebola, AIDS, all sorts of things they claim that it'll cure. Honestly, it's, I mean, I thought the Peter Popoff stuff was bad enough, but at least that water, miracle water, doesn't kill you. Yeah. At least that doesn't happen and such. But this, this right here, this can actually help or even damage your child. Yeah. Uh, just, ugh. And the way they say this works harkens all the way back to Andrew Wakefield. They say that there are these parasites called ropeworms. There's no such thing as ropeworms. And... Apparently, they say they get into your colon and cause digestive problems, and then the digestive problems cause autism, you know, just like just like Wakefield said. No truth to it whatsoever. And, in fact, this is a bleach that can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and severe dehydration, according to the FDA. There is at least one death from using this. Uh, they found out that this will quickly bleach cloth, and the article even mentions one scientist talking to WFMY News here in North Carolina, that's Channel 2 just up there in the triad, saying that she would only use it to clean her shower. And they use it on children. Oh, this this stuff right here. Seriously, why aren't they in in jail? I I, I mean... Well, uh, the uh, reason why is because they're not selling the substance directly. What they do is they sell things like a $199 MMS home video course and all these NMS seminars that teach you how you can use it to cure your kids without actually selling it himself. And there's also a woman named Carrie Rivera, who is a bishop in Humble's Church. Uh, She wrote a book called Healing the Symptoms Known as Autism. You don't even want to get me started on that title. Uh. In which she recommends giving autistic children hourly doses, hourly doses of chlorine dioxide and advocates chlorine dioxide enemas as a way to kill pathogens in the brain. I just... Enema kills something in the brain. Uh, (laughs) What? Do they they even know biology? Do do, 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 do they just just sit there and just say, well, it has to make to the brain somehow. It's it's enters the body. Uh, As I once said about someone else, maybe she has her head up her ass so far she can no longer tell the difference between the two. Uh, I think it is. I I just don't understand this. Here's something right to quote, which honestly just wants me to punch, uh, punch a hole in the wall. It says, quote, when there are alarming side effects from the animus, the solution is more animus. <laughs> hey, why don't you just give away a, a, a milkshake full of thumbtacks? Why don't you just 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 to keep doing that type of stuff? I, I, I this stuff right here is just honestly, you know, it really is frustrating to see these type of things and, and, and get away with it. I, 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 this is to me again. This should be they should be charged. I mean. And I honestly think they should be all, every single person involved with this 
should not only go to jail for every single type of money they got from this goes to um, family members who uh, have suffered from this, especially the kids or what have you, put them in a scholarship or something like that for them, and just, you know, and never be talked about or heard from ever again. That, to me, would be real justice. Well, I really like this article here in Vice.com because there's just so many things that was done right. For example, they talked to Emily Willingham, and she's a science writer. She's written for Forbes, and she's the author of the book Thinking Person's Guide to Autism. And so she said, quote, One of the tenets of the Vaccines Cause Autism movement is that the vaccines contain toxins, that a leaky gut is somehow involved, and that these vulnerabilities lead to parasitic infections, yeast overload, and a host of other weird, unrelated things that need to be treated. And of course, there's no truth to that. He also corresponded with the South African doctor, Louise Lindbergh. She actually tested stool samples given to her by a patient who used chlorine dioxide in herself and her children. She found no evidence of parasites. Quote, The microbiology did not reveal any parasites or even eggs. History confirmed that it was a combination of mucus, plant material, probiotic flora, and gut cells. In other words, all the stuff that's supposed to be there. And she said, quote, I feel that it is potentially very harmful and does not cure autism in any way. Well, Fiona Leary says it best. She's an autism advocate and a mother of two autistic children herself. Uh, She said, quote, We need to stop with these quack treatments because they're dangerous, they're not authorized, they're not proven, and if anything, they're proven to cause real harm. It's something like from a Stephen King horror film. They're guinea pigs. She's talking about the autistic children here. They don't have a life. From the minute that they wake up in the morning, they're dosed with chlorine dioxide. They're dosed throughout the day. Parents are removing them from school because they're not allowed to dose at school, and they're hiding from child protection authorities because they know what they're doing is wrong. Yeah, and honestly, they should be in jail. They should be locked up in jail, and the whole practice should be shut down. No no type of way they're not there, man. O'Leary also said, quote, They're so far removed from what they're doing sometimes that you think they shouldn't even have a dog. They're not fit to have children. And he quoted Willingham one more time, quote, Autism is a neurodevelopmental condition that traces to early fetal development. You can't bleach it away. And autistic people deserve respect and attention to their personhood. And I got to say, right on, Willingham. Amen. Amen. You know, I hope people share this thing right now. And uh, and fine, because these people should be in jail. Like I said, They should be locked up and never even see the light of day. So there's absolutely no way we could avoid naming Jim Humble this week's Idiot Extraordinaire. Well, that wraps up this, you know, being from another planet, I didn't have much to do with this edition of the Bogosity Podcast. As always, you can come to forum.bogosity.tv to read the show notes and join the discussion. This podcast depends on you to keep going, so please donate using the links on the website or at patreon.bogosity.tv and feel free to join in by sending a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at bogosity.tv. You can even stick it in an audio file if you want. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to Charles Thomas for joining me. No problem, Shane. Until next time, here's a quote from Temple Grandin. If, by some magic, autism had been eradicated from the face of the earth, then men would still be socializing in front of a wood fire at the entrance to a cave. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivative 3.0 Imported License. Bogosity. Do you want answers to creationist claims against evolution? Would you like to know more about evolution yourself, or even engage creationists more directly, with actual peer-reviewed sources to back you up? My book, How Evolution is Scientific, is designed to show the basics of evolutionary theory and how it is so well supported using the scientific method. It's impeccably sourced, with references to the actual scientific material, and is arranged using the creationists' own criteria of what is scientific. Using their own arguments against them, see how evolution is scientific, but creationism is not. Based on observations, accurate predictions, logic, and evidence. Get answers to common creationist claims, and even a primer on abiogenesis, the start of all life. 
It's all in my book, How Evolution is Scientific, available at Amazon and on Kindle, EPUB, and PDF as well. Get How Evolution is Scientific and never be taken in by creationists again.